Welcome to the ministry of Happy and Jeannie Caldwell. And now, here's Happy Caldwell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday broadcast. We continue this week with my message from the Kenneth Copeland Ministers Conference, and I taught on the commandment of love. Our focus today is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. When we commit to walk in love, the Holy Ghost is so wonderful to supernaturally allow us to love every person around us, even those who are unlovely. Our hearts become so filled with the love of God, we can't help but to love those we come in contact with. Do you want to know that kind of love? Then stay tuned for today's broadcast. But get ready. Jeannie's going to minister to us in song. If you need healing or deliverance, receive from God as she sings, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome.
Father, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you that you're here tonight to meet the needs, to heal the bodies, deliver the souls that need to be delivered in Jesus' name. All I could think to say was get it out of the street. In fact, that was the last thing I remember saying. The next thing I remember was being put into an ambulance on a stretcher. I had absolutely no fear for I felt God's presence. The doctors wanted to put three rods in my back to support my vertebrae column, but I chose not to have the surgery. I knew in my heart that God would supernaturally take care of me. Learning to Trust God's Faithfulness is a book about Jeannie Caldwell's real life encounters with God. She shares them with you in the hope that your faith and trust in a loving Heavenly Father will increase. To order the book, Learning to Trust God's Faithfulness, call 800-264-2525 or visit our website at vtntv.com. And now, here's Pastor Caldwell with today's message. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. Now, if you go down to verse 13, Paul sums this up by saying, and now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You want to know why love is greater? Why it's the greatest? First of all, it doesn't fail. It won't fail. Faith can fail. Jesus prayed for Peter and said, I pray your faith won't fail. And faith works or is empowered by love. Without love, your faith won't work. And without faith, there's hope. Faith is the substance of what's hoped for. So all these three work together, but he said the greatest is love. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to look at these words describing the Apostle Paul. I always thought of the Apostle John as the Apostle of love. Brother Hagin used to say that he believed the reason that John was the only disciple that didn't get martyred was because he was the Apostle of love. He walked in love. They tried to kill him, boil him in oil, and he just stepped out of the pot. And then they banished him to the Isle of Patmos where he stayed for about a year and a half. But his assignment had not yet been totally fulfilled. And you know, the Bible says you can live as long as you're satisfied in Psalm 91. That's not until you get fed up with everything. <laughs> That's until you have finished your assignment. Yeah. Old Robert's assignment was to bring healing to his generation. He did that. His generation's gone. Brother Hagin's assignment was to teach my people faith. He did that. Brother Summerall's assignment was to show God's strength to this generation. He did that. All of us have an assignment. We have things that God has put in us. But John's assignment hadn't been fulfilled because at the cross, Jesus looked down at John and said, Behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. So John had an assignment to complete, and that was to take care of Jesus' mother, which he did. They both lived over the city of Ephesus and attended the church there until they both died. John took care of Jesus' mother. And did you notice, you go back and read where John always wrote of himself. I love this. I think it's so precious. He always wrote of himself and spoke of himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. <laughs> Peter and John ran to the grave to check out to see whether Jesus had been raised or not. And John writes and said, the apostle that Jesus loved did outrun Peter. <laughs> I tell you, love will even make you run fast. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us, compels us, the love of Christ constrains us. It compels us. Now, now listen to this. I, I love this about Paul. You, you normally think of John the Apostle as the Apostle of love, but the Apostle Paul, he, he tapped into 
a, an, a level of love that we have not attained to yet. Paul walked in love to the extent that he was thought at many times to be beside himself. That the love of God had taken hold of his heart. Now he said the love of God constrains us, compels us. Jesus was moved with compassion toward the leper. The love of God will move you toward someone. The same love that caused Jesus to die for man had constrained Paul's heart to live for man. That's why he said, I am in a strait betwixt two. I don't know whether to depart or stay. In myself, I am ready to be offered, but it's more expedient for you that I stay. Paul's attitude of love was, I love them, people, as though I had died for them. Now you stop and think about it. We've got, we've got some backtracking to do in our lives. I love them as though I had died for them. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. We can go there and see these things in the Scripture. Philippians 1, 21. He said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I would not, for I'm in a strait between twixt, between two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You can't quit. Not until you've finished your assignment. You will, how will I know? Well, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're sitting here today? How do you know you have clothes on? How do you know you're hungry? You'll know. Nobody will have to tell you. You won't have to ask for prayer. You won't have to, you know, fast and pray 30 days. You'll know when you've completed your assignment. Who was it, E.W. Kenyon? Told his daughter Kathleen, just finished breakfast, read his favorite scripture, and said, today I'm going to be with the Lord. He was gone. Brother Hagin reached over and patted Aretha on the hand, smiled real big, and left. Brother Summerall told his three sons. He came out of a coma. He said, you boys ready to take the ministry? He said, if it's all the same to you all, he said, I'm done. I'm going home. He was gone. Smith Wigglesworth died on the platform in church behind the pulpit. How do you know when you're ready? Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul said in verse 6, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Those three things will identify whether your, your assignment is over. You've finished your course. Boy, that's so important. And if you go back to Acts, I don't have that in my notes, but if you go back to the book of Acts, somewhere in the, in the middle part of the, the book, the Apostle Paul said, I finished my course with joy. Joy. Everybody say joy. joy. I finished my course with joy. I'm out of here. So love must be enthroned in the heart. It must govern the life. Now turn over to Romans 5 and verse 5, and this is what the Lord wanted me to share with you of my personal experiences. Now, personal experiences should not become doctrine. We've all had personal experiences. You can share your personal experience, but you can't teach it as doctrine. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Now, the Lord brought this to my remembrance when I started teaching on love. He said, do you remember when you were saved? I said, yes, sir. I even have a picture 
of when I was saved. I didn't know it existed until a few years ago. A man came to me. He was at the, at the meeting in the Grand Ole Opry, uh, the old Ryman Auditorium, the night I got saved, February 11, 1972. He was there taking pictures, and Jeannie and I were sitting on the front row. I was in the balcony. But when Pastor Jimmy Snow gave the altar call and said, if you need a new life, Jesus is the only way you're going to get that new life, I came down to the front. Actually, I got, I got, I headed the wrong direction. I went backstage and ran into Tex Ritter. <laughs> came back out to the front, prayed with Pastor Jimmy Snow, son of Hank Snow, got born again. And Jeannie and I were sitting on the front row of the Grand Ole Opry, Old Ryman Auditorium, and this guy was taking pictures. And he had made a collage of pictures of that first radio program you all have been there. Remember when we went there? And, and there we were on the front row. I tell you, we looked like a couple of refugees. I mean, <laughs> it was pitiful. Now, she looked good, but I looked pitiful. Because, see, I was in the liquor business. And I don't only sold liquor. I was my best customer. <laughs> and there I was sitting on the front row. Now, how many people have a picture of themselves getting saved, getting born again? And I told my wife, I said, honey, I think our life is getting ready to change because I made the profession of my faith, asked Jesus to come into my heart, was born again. I totally changed. I was a different person from that day on. Alcohol, gone, no desire, delivered from everything. Old things passed away, all things become new. I went home, told my, my sister first, and then I told my dad. Uh, I told my whole family. And, and then I started Monday morning back in my job, and I hit the first liquor store, and I told my liquor store clerk, the first one, Carl Bagley. I said, Carl, let me tell you what happened to me. He said, what? I said, I got saved. He said, you got what? I said, I got saved. He said, I don't want to hear about that. I said, but I want to tell you. Now, I didn't know anything. Jeannie told me to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I didn't know what that was. I read Matthew. I read Mark. I said, they, they printed the same story twice. I mean, this basically... <laughs> But I told him anyway. Now, I didn't know anything. And the Lord told me. He said, I don't have any evangelists or preachers going into liquor stores, so you can do the job of an evangelist while you're there. Just tell them what happened to you. And he said this to me. He said, because you don't know anything else. You don't know anything about the Bible. So just tell them what happened to you. I was blind, now I see. I was lost, now I'm saved. I just told them what happened to me. And I, what I realized, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I realized it later, I was so different, I was so changed that nobody recognized me. Nobody knew who I was. My family didn't know who I was. They were afraid of me. I was their friend when they buy liquor from me wholesale, but now <laughs> they did not know who I was because I was so different. I was a different person, and I loved everybody. I just thought this is awesome. And I thought everybody in every church was the same way. I thought everybody in church loves each other, I started tithing. They put me on the stewardship committee because they didn't have anybody that tithed. <laughs> I mean, my life totally changed. Now, my mother-in-law, Jewel, Jeannie's mother, we called her Munner. She was so precious. Pentecostal saint, I mean, pray in tongues, intercessor, I mean, and she kept telling me, now, honey, you need to get the Holy Ghost. My mother had died early and, and, and many years ago, and so Munner became my second mother. She said, now, honey, you need to get the Holy Ghost. I said, what's that? She said, you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Jeannie said, Munner, just leave him alone. He doesn't know what that is. Just let him enjoy his salvation. But she kept after me. Three months went by. I was in church on a Sunday night. The pastor was preaching. Now, I had gone to the altar to get filled with the Holy Ghost many times. But I'd go up there and I'd kneel. You know, I had a kneeling bench across the front. I'd kneel. I'd say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost, but if it's not time, I can wait. Thank you. And I'd get up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> but this Sunday night was different. <laughs> I couldn't wait for the preacher to quit preaching. I didn't hear what he said. I didn't care. I had to get down here to the front because that's what I thought. That's where I thought everything happened at the altar. I didn't know you'd get filled with the Holy Ghost. Jeannie got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in her bedroom, uh, you know, praying beside the bed. I didn't know you could get filled. With, I, I, I thought everything happened down here. So I got down there. I lifted up my hands. Now, this is the only way I can describe it. Whoosh! I mean, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, Jeannie's on one side, my mother-in-law's on the other side, and there's another lady on the other side of my mother, about 300 pounds, you couldn't get your arms all the way around her. 
She was so big. But when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I, I just began to weep and cry, and I hugged everybody, and I went to this lady to hug her, and I told her I loved her, and I thought, I don't even know this lady. <laughs> Who is she? I could not help myself because the love of God had been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I had another, it was kind of like I was ratcheted up another notch, I, I, another level of love that I had never experienced before. And as you know, you start seeking the Lord, what am I supposed to do? What do you want me to do? Where am I supposed to go? Uh, he kept me in the liquor business for a year. So don't tell me you can't work your job. I stayed in that business for a year, witnessed all my customers, learned about love. So I, I was experiencing something I had never experienced before. And I began to see how the Holy Spirit wanted to use me to minister His love to other people. But you, you still don't realize that this is a, a life. This is a walk. It's not just once or twice. It's just not on Sunday morning. This is not when you feel good. It's not when everybody loves you. So we started traveling the ministry in our little 72 Dodge van. We'd go down the highway, coast to coast, border to border. And we were down in South Louisiana. We turned off this little road, and I saw this sign. They'd written it with this white shoe polish on the window of this cafe, and it said, Fresh homemade chicken and sausage gumbo. Man, I put on the brakes, went in reverse. We packed into that, that restaurant, got some of that chicken and sausage gumbo. And the waitress that was waiting on us, man, she was scarred. You could tell she was hurting. You'd tell she's had a rough life. And when she came to wait on us, the Lord said, when you go to pay your bill, I want you to tell her that I still love her. Okay, Lord, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. So we got ready to go out. I went up to the counter and paid my bill, and I said, Ma'am, can I tell you something? She said, Yes. I said, The Lord Jesus told me to tell you He still loves you. Oh, man, she just began to weep. She began to cry. She thanked me. It touched her heart. I went into one of the liquor stores that I called on, and by the way, that first man that I witnessed to, Carl Begley, 20 years later, I was given an altar call on Sunday morning. And an elderly gentleman walked down the aisle and walked up to the front to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And I walked up to him, and I very seldom forget a face or a name. It was Carl Begley. 20 years later, I got the privilege of praying with him to get him born again. Amen. So, I went to this liquor store. Now, I'm born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I walked up. The clerk's not there. And so, I'm looking around. I knew him. His name was John. I, I, he, I liked him. He was a nice guy. I heard this music coming out of the back room. Stay tuned next week for the continuation of this message. Be sure and join me next week, same time, as we continue our teaching on the commandment of love. We love to pray for people. We love to hear from people. Here's a viewer that writes and says, My family is deep in debt. We have so many bills. We've fallen behind. I'm on disability. My husband works, but we still can't pay the bills. Can you pray that God will deliver us from all of our bills and that they will be paid in full? Now, you know, if I could pray for you to be delivered from all your bills, I'd pray that I could be delivered from all my bills. I know what you mean, but I want you to realize that God will supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God wants to deliver you from debt, and He wants to deliver you from the pressure and the stress of debt. But I've learned over the years, and I'll share this with you, you have to sow a seed. So you and your husband pray and ask God what kind of seed, how much, 
does He want you to sow and where does He want you to sow it? And you sow that seed and you write on there a debt-breaking seed and God will have something to work on. Now let me pray for you. And anybody else that's watching today, you're in that same situation. You release your faith. Lay your hand on that television as a point of contact. Father, I break the power of debt and stress over my brother and sister. I pray for you to deliver them and liberate them from debt. I pray for you to supernaturally multiply their seed sown and cause a harvest to come back to them so they can catch up on all their bills. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to pray and stand in agreement with you. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, you can email it to me at happycallwell at vtntv.com. You can also call the 1-800 number 264-2525. Send in your prayer request and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Before we close today, uh, here's an opportunity to, for you to get some material that will help you. The Believer's Authority book and Bible study. Watch this. From the beginning of creation to the ministry of Jesus and throughout the church age, no message has been more revolutionary, life-changing, or misunderstood than that of the Believer's Authority. Pastor Happy Caldwell has tackled this complex teaching in his new book and spirit-led Bible study, Believer's Authority. In this powerful duo, he reveals how you, a believer in Christ, can use your own kingdom authority to release God's healing power, set captives free from Satan's snares, overcome the spirits of fear, depression, and poverty, and perform miracles in the mighty name of Jesus. To order your very own Believer's Authority book and Bible study, call toll-free 1-800-264-2525. The book is just $14.99 and the Bible study is only $19.99. The spiritual battle is real, but through these powerful, time-tested scriptural principles, you can be a victor instead of a victim. I want to encourage you to order that series. It'll help you understand what your authority as a believer is, and it has not only the book, but the workbook, the Bible study that goes along with it. Join me on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at happy underscore Caldwell. And be sure to join Jeannie and me next week, same time. Remember, happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. You can watch today's show online. Simply log on to vtntv.com and click Happy Caldwell. If you'd like to order today's broadcast on DVD, you may call 1-800-264-2525 and ask for the offer number on the screen. To contact this ministry, you may write to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. You may also call us at 501-223-2525. And be sure to visit us online at vtntv.com.